Okay. All right. So thank you for being here. Um, welcome to our second Marine Geology and Geophysics Seminar. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that Bay Campus is located on uh, the unceded land of the Narragansett people. And if you're joining us remotely, I encourage you to look up and reflect on whose land you're on. And a good resource to do this is a website, um, native-land.ca. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Christi Christina Wolowski. Dr. Wolowski received her PhD from the University of Oregon and then worked as a postdoctoral research assistant at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. She worked as an assistant professor at Middlebury College and is now joining us as an assistant professor of geology at Western Washington University. So we're really happy to have you here. Thank you. Thanks so much for the nice introduction, Isabel. So um, it really is a privilege and a pleasure to share some of my work with you all today. Uh, funny enough, uh, this is a continuation of work I did as a postdoc at the University of Edinburgh. Um, you can see below that the co-authors listed on the slide um, are at random UK institutions. But funny enough, I did do a lot of this work um, it, at, in Rhode Island, actually. Um, all, despite the pandemic, I was supposed to spend a pre-tenure sabbatical at the University of Edinburgh, but because of COVID and immigration problems, I ended up choosing to spend it in Wakefield, Rhode Island and got to visit your campus, which was really great. Um, and so while this work was supposed to be there, it was actually done uh, where you all are now. So I'm excited to share that with you today. But before I really get into boron recycling in the mantle and ocean island basalts, I also wanted to introduce myself and sort of the work that I've done more generally. And so most of my career, um, I have spent studying cinder cone magmas. So this is an example of a cinder cone. There are um, basaltic volcanoes that tend to erupt only once. And one of the reasons that I have studied cinder cone volcanoes is that because they, they erupt primarily basalt, um, basalts are partial melts of the mantle. And by studying the chemistry of basalts, igneous petrologists have an opportunity to essentially see through the crust and interrogate processes that are happening within the mantle. And so through my career, I've looked at cinder cone magmas and tried to understand how magma forms in subduction zones. So trying to ask questions like, what is the role of water in magma formation at subduction zones? And how might these processes vary globally at different subduction zones where there are thermal structures or different uh, geology? Today, I'll be talking to you about the work that I've done on trying to use basaltic magmas to understand how the mantle has evolved over time. So by studying ocean island basalts, we can ask questions like, what is the volatile character of different heterogeneous reservoirs of the mantle? Um, how has the mantle evolved over time as the result of plate tectonic processes and recycling of um, oceanic crust and lithosphere? However, um, through my career, I've also found that, you know, while basalts do provide us windows into the mantle, um, if you zoom into all these places, you realize that basalt in many cases still has to traverse the crust. And so I also use tools like petrography and whole rock geochemistry, mineral chemistry and zonation and melt inclusions, which I'll talk about in a little bit, to better understand where and how magmas are stored um, and how might they evolve chemically prior to eruption. I've also done work looking at diffusion in minerals um, to understand how magmas transit the crust and what the time scales of those processes might be. And most recently, I've actually started to employ more micro and macro textural analysis. So looking at the textures of bubbles and crystals uh, of explosively erupted material from cinder cone volcanoes to understand um, how pre-eruptive process like the rate of decompression, degassing, or stalling can impact eruption style. And so um, a lot of this work, you know, I'm looking at basaltic magmas and I'm looking at cinder cones, um, but the reason I'm doing that, in addition to curiosity, is that if we can understand the processes that drive volcanic eruptions, we can better inform hazard models. Additionally, from a more scientific perspective, um, by studying sort of the evolution of the mantle and how magmas form, we actually get a better understanding of the long-term cycling of volatile elements like water and carbon and oxygen 
And um, the geochemical cycles of these elements, they are hypothesized to drive plate tectonics and mantle convection, um, but they also play a really important role of the formation and the sustainability of the planet that we live on that is actually habitable for humans. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about a scientific question or data that addresses that second societal impact. And that is this uh, looking at boron in ocean island basalts to better understand um, recycling of material into and out of the mantle and hopefully get a better understanding of volatile element cycling into and out of the mantle. So I'm sort of harping on that a little bit more, the input and output at volatile boundaries um, has really major controls on both the physical and chemical evolution of the solid earth. And it's thought that for the most part, you know, subduction um, puts things into the mantle. Uh, so subducted slabs have lots of volatiles, water and carbon, but also other elements. And these get input into the mantle. Some of that gets recycled immediately out at subduction zones or back arc basins, and some of it ends up into the deeper mantle. Um, but it's really under, it's really challenging to actually see into the deeper mantle. And one of the reasons why all these lines are sort of squiggly and all over the place is because there's still a lot of uncertainty uh, regarding the distribution of various elements in the interior of the earth. And one of the challenges, especially when it comes to volatile elements, is that volatiles are, they're volatile. So they get lost to the atmosphere during volcanic eruptions. Um, and if we're using basalt to peer into the mantle, and we were just going to pick up a lava at the surface, that lava is not going to tell us anything um, about the initial volatile content of the mantle. Um, because volatiles decrease in solubility with decreasing pressure and they're degassed. So how do we get around this problem? Uh, there is sort of, from my perspective, um, what I'm gonna talk about today is two different solutions. One of the solutions is utilizing things called melt inclusions. So these are small blobs or blebs or parcels, whatever word or vocabulary word you like of magma trapped inside of crystals that are growing beneath the surface. And the hope is that you pick a mineral like olivine that's growing at significant depth, that it, the melt inclusion gets trapped before significant degassing occurs. And that gives you a snapshot of that magma um, before it degasses. So potentially the initial water content. You can also utilize things like, utilize proxies. Um, and in the next few slides, I'll describe why boron isotopes might be a good proxy. Um, and in fact, in this study, we decided to do both. So not only did we look at melt inclusions, uh, so we measured water, CO2, trace elements, but also boron isotopes in melt inclusions. Because melt inclusions tend to be really small, so they are inclusions inside of crystals that are already small, um, a lot of people compare them to a width of a human hair, you need to use really, um, really, um, high resolution geochemical techniques. For this study, we used two different types of secondary ion mass spectrometry, which allow for an in-situ spot or analysis size that's about 10 to 20 microns in diameter. Uh, we used two different instruments, which are both found at the University of Edinburgh. The first is the IMF-4F. Um, it's hard to see the scale on these, but um, a little bit smaller. Uh, we use it to measure water, CO2, chlorine, fluorine, and boron. We also then measured boron isotopes using the larger instrument, the IMF-1270, also at the University of Edinburgh. And so we measured these boron isotopes, but why did we do that in the first place? So boron seems to be, um, well, actually, you all, a lot of you know about the ocean. It's found in pretty, it's pretty important for ocean and things like pH, but in terms of magma chemistry, why do we want to use boron um, to study mantle process? And it turns out that the isotopes of boron are really good tracers or fingerprints of material that was once at the surface that then got introduced to the mantle. And that's because boron fractionates really strongly at the Earth's surface. And there are a lot of different reservoirs at the Earth's surface that have different fingerprints of boron isotopes. Um, but once you introduce those into the deep mantle, at high temperatures, boron isotopes don't fractionate. So that signal from the surface is essentially locked in. Um, an easy way to think about this um, is that, you know, if you have a mid-ocean ridge or a basalt sitting at the sea floor, it started off at negative seven, 
If you hydrothermally alter it by seawater, which is really heavy, you end up with altered oceanic crust that is pretty positive. Um, and if you put, put that into the mantle, um, then you know that fingerprint is gonna be really distinct relative to the mantle, which probably is about negative 10 or negative seven, or that is the hypothesis. We do have to worry, oh, jumping ahead. So um, this has actually been really well demonstrated to work in the study of arc magmas. So here we have a figure of delta 11 boron, so boron isotopes versus niobium over boron. Here, niobium is an element that is um, incompatible. And so by ratioing boron to it, we're normalizing away little subtle differences in magmatic process like degrees of partial melting or fractional crystallization. But in essence, you can think about it as boron concentration in these different um, rock types or lithologies um, increasing to the left. So serpentinites have a higher boron concentration than mid-ocean ridge basalts um, representative of the depleted upper mantle. And so this sort of classic study in 2012 demonstrated that many arc magmas, their chemistry in boron, this boron space is really well explained by mixing between the depleted upper mantle, which is what's melting in arc, which has contributions from serpentinites and altered oceanic crust fluids um, or continental sediments. So all of these things that get subducted, um, get introduced to the mantle, and that fingerprint is what we see in the magma that's erupted at arcs. So this should work on other types of basalts like ocean island basalts. But there is also one thing that we also have to worry about. And it turns out that boron also fractionates during the subduction process. So here's an example of a subducting slab. And with increasing depth, this subducting slab progressively loses its water. So high water concentration is blue, low water concentration is red. And through that metamorphic dehydration, fluids are constantly being lost. It turns out that during that fluid release, so with increasing pressure here, equivalent to increasing depth over here, boron isotopes through this dehydration process become progressively isotopically lighter. So here showing that fluids in the slab go from, you know, positive five um, altered oceanic crust all the way down to something like negative 30. Uh, so losing boron and getting isotopically light. So the residual slab here is potentially very isotopically light if it lost all of its water. If it retained some of its water, it might be somewhere in the middle here if it didn't lose much water um, or you know, the water that's released beneath arcs might be somewhere up here. And so what I was getting at is, so again, you go from this positive five to negative 25 through progressive dehydration of the slab, but of course, this is going to be really dependent on the amount of dehydration experienced by the slab. So we can be sort of anywhere along this trajectory. So I talked a lot about boron in arcs um, and a lot of a lot more work has been done on boron in arcs. Um, and it seems to be a great fingerprint for that recycling process. And so if we go to ocean island basalts, it turns out that the reason why we want to use this recycled component fingerprint is because there's a lot of work using radiogenic isotopes like 8786 strontium or 206204 lead that suggests that ocean island basalts, um, uh, the result of hot spots, actually tap different heterogeneous mantle domains. And I really love showing this radiogenic isotope plot because I like calling it the handprint plot. Um, and it shows that the mantle is extremely heterogeneous and there are sort of mixing arrays and all different components dragging these magma chemistries in a million different directions. Um, in general, this a figure like this um, or this distribution in isotope, isotope space is suggested to be mixing between various primordial or primitive mantle components. So components in the mantle that have essentially changed very little since the early formation of the earth with various components that have been recycled from the Earth's surface. So whether that is um, altered oceanic crust or subducted continental crust or sediments. Um, and these different arrays we have, you know, all this stuff gets mixed in and scientists have called these enriched mantle one, enriched mantle two, and, and high mu for um, high uranium uh, lead. Okay, so 
in this study, our hypothesis is really simple. So if we go to these places where previous workers have shown through radiogenic isotope data that there is a recycled component or a primitive or primordial component, um, that these different types of components should have resolvable differences in their delta-11 boron compositions if boron really is a great fingerprint of that surface stuff that is then recycled. So to get samples for this study, um, we both collected our own samples as well as got samples from uh, sample repositories. We were able to get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different really nice ocean island basalts that both span the globe spatially, but also um, represent a lot of these end members in this radiogenic isotope compositional space. Um, a few to point out, La Reunion is considered sort of a, um, a component that has changed very little since the formation of the early earth. Um, it is considered a primordial mantle component, uh, while places like La Palma and the Canary Islands or Tristan da Cunha or the Raw Seamount are suggested to have recycled components um, in their mantle source regions. So I wanted to share a few photos because geology talks are always great to have some nice photos. So this is a photo I took in 2016 from the Cumbre Vieja Ridge. This is an image of Volcan Duras Narrow on La Palma and the Canary Islands uh, where we collected some samples Here's another image of um, another postdoc at Oxford, Rosie Jones, who I worked with and collected samples with of Volcan Tenegia. So this volcano erupted in 1971. Um, but maybe some of you are now, it's so interesting giving this talk now, where like a month ago, no one had any idea what I was talking about, because now um, this is what it looks like in the right where those pictures were taken in the Cumbre Vieja Ridge. Um, there is actively a new cinder cone that is erupting there. It began erupting about a month ago on September 19th. Um, it is hands down the most well-documented cinder cone eruption in history. Um, and it's been really exciting to see the eruption evolve and change and see the imagery over time. Um, on a hazards related note, uh, this area was being monitored and there was a great seismic signal and they were able to evacuate the area before um, uh, much damage was done. And so there has no, been no loss of life, but there has been um, a lot of infrastructure. And in fact, the Spanish government has had to um, provide tens of millions of dollars in aid to help evacuate people um, and um, house people who have lost their homes uh, to this eruption. But it is, um, hopefully you're um, sort of blown away by this imagery as I am. Um, it's a pretty amazing record. So yeah, so a much different place than when I was there um, just a few years ago. Um, but of course, um, as I mentioned before, and I think many of you at GSO are familiar with, is that actually most of the samples that I got came from a sample repository um, from Geomar. This is in Kiel, Germany. And many of the samples were either dredged or cored from the seafloor around these various ocean islands, um, both in the South Pacific and the South Atlantic. So what does the data look like? So here, a plot of Delta 11 boron versus nothing. So um, I've been told this is a classic Caltech plot, so nothing to worry about on the x-axis, but just a way for us to look at what is the distribution of delta-11 boron that I actually measured. So a lot going on in this plot though. So the filled symbols, those are um, averages from a suite of about 10 to 20 melt inclusions. In some places, I was able to get a suite of melt inclusions, but also measure um, either submarine glass um, or scoria glass from the exact same sample. Um, you can see that in some cases, the melt inclusions and the glass don't agree, where in some places, the melt inclusions and glass do agree. There are places like St. Helena, where I was not able to get melt inclusion data, um, or Tristan da Cunha. Also on this plot, you have mid-ocean ridge basalts. So that's a global compilation from Marshall et al. 2017. Um, 
uh, so an estimate of the depleted upper mantle. And also there's previous data from places like Iceland, Hawaii, and Samoa with these darker bars, the um, accepted range of values for the primary composition. So just, just looking at this plot a little bit, um, a few takeaways for me, most of the data actually overlaps with that mid-ocean ridge basalt. So the depleted upper mantle. And that is not very, very, uh, there's not a lot of variability in mid-ocean ridge basalts globally. We do see a handful of samples that are lighter, isotopically lighter. Um, so at places like Fogo and La Palma um, and the McDonald Seamounts. But what's really fascinating is that in our data set, we didn't measure anything that was statistically heavier than mid-ocean ridge basalts, which we found pretty peculiar, considering that we would hypothesize that a lot of our recycled materials might have that heavy component. So we want to also consider the boron concentration in this because it's really important. So here now a plot of delta 11 boron versus boron concentration. We can see that you know, ocean island basalts and mid-ocean ridge basalts here in black, ocean island basalts in these circles um, from this study, uh, they overlap in their delta 11b, but the, have, the ocean island basalts have slightly higher concentrations of boron. Um, this actually is likely a result of the fact that ocean island basalts tend to be lower degree partial melts, uh, so the boron concentration isn't as diluted. So whether or not this difference is inherent of the mantle source from which they were derived, I'll um, get into in a little bit uh, more detail in a few slides. Previous data from ocean island basalts is a little bit more distributed. It's pretty concentrated with our data and the mid-ocean ridge basalt data, but it sort of scatters to higher values. But you can see that these populations are really distinctly different from the pink data, which are a compilation of basaltic magmas erupted at arcs or subduction zones globally. And so trying to compare these again in histogram form, you can see that arcs um, have much heavier boron isotope values than mid-ocean ridge basalts, while ocean island basalts from this study also overlap with those morbs and extend to lighter values. Our data is a little bit different from previous studies, which um, extend to having some more positive values. But what's really interesting is that actually, if you were to cull that data and only consider data with greater than six weight percent MGO, you actually see that, so more primitive basaltic magmas, so magmas that have experienced less fractionation or less chemical evolution, all of a sudden you don't even see those few heavy values in, anymore. And what, what I hypothesize this is telling us is that Boron contamination is really prevalent, prevalent and you need to be really careful. So seawater has a ton of heavy boron in it. And some recent work has suggested that even a little bit of assimilation of whether it's seawater, brine, or material that was altered by seawater, if you sort of introduce or contaminate your magma with some of that material, even less than 3%, which you might not even see in major elements, then your delta 11 boron can be thrown off. I think this is really hi nicely highlighted um, in a study by Mary Jo Browns, who is an alum of uh, URI GSO. Uh, she's now an assistant professor at UC Riverside. So here in her work looking at melt inclusions from Iceland, she showed that you know if you start with a mid-ocean ridge basalt, if you alter it with low temperature seawater alteration, you get those heavier isotopic values. But actually what's interesting is that if you assimilate materials that have experienced low temperature adsorption from geothermal fluids, those actually have isotopically light boron values, although they do have more boron or higher boron concentrations. So it's really, really hard to see this boron contamination in these samples because um, can, you know, Basalts have a tortuous path to the surface, and even though oceanic crust is thin, it, um, crustal contamination can still happen. And so, and you can drag that boron isotope value into light values or heavy values. So each sample needs to be really carefully assessed individually. And because it's really hard to see, so say you only have one sample 
um, from an ocean island, you can't really create these mixing diagrams um, focusing on the highest MGO compositions. So those that have fractionated the least are more likely to preserve the mantle fingerprint. And so a cautionary tale, um, and here one that suggests that, um, you know, most of these OIBs that have heavy values, those might actually be the result of contamination upon ascent um, and eruption. And so the true range in boron isotopes globally is pretty restricted actually, and not super different from mid-ocean ridge basalts, which is really interesting, which is a really interesting result. At first I was really bummed out like, oh, we don't see a huge range in boron isotopes like we were expecting, but this lack of variability tells us something really interesting. So, so now I'm gonna focus in here. I'm only showing you data from individual melt inclusions rather than the averages. So again, Delta 11 boron on the Y axis. And now we're ratioing boron to cerium. So another incompatible element normalizing away differences um, in melting or fractional crystallization. So hopefully by ratioing boron here, um, we're actually comparing different source regions. So thinking about this as, so now boron is um, on top. So boron is increasing to the right. So what we find is that for places like La Palma and McDonald and Fogo, where previous work has identified recycled components, not only do we see those their boron isotope values, but we also see that they're really, really depleted in boron or boron concentration. So if we have less boron than the depleted upper mantle or mid-ocean ridge basalts, um, then this change is not the result of contamination, which would increase the boron. It would throw things over here. Um, but actually this seems really consistent with the fact that these recycled components they might be these subducted slabs that got totally stripped of boron and ended up really isotopic component that has experienced significant or near complete dehydration, um, which is really interesting as the end member and tells us something about how efficient volatile recycling is for slabs in subduction zones and how much water might be going down into the mantle. Um, what's also really interesting is sort of this overlap of the La Reunion data with mid-ocean ridge basalts. As I mentioned before, a lot of work on La Reunion, uh, previous work using other isotopic systems, has suggested that La Reunion is a really good proxy for a primitive or unperturbed mantle, that it has been undisturbed for billions of years, and that it doesn't have a recycled component. And so the result of reunion, seemingly very similar, both in you know, boron and trace element composition and isotopic composition to mid-ocean ridge basalt, suggests that either the you know, primitive mantle has a boron delta 11b that is similar to morb, or it's telling us that you know, at these very voluminous high temperature mantle plume areas, so much melting is happening in the upper mantle that essentially morb dilutes the plume signature. Um, but that would also suggest that the plume might have less boron than morb. Um, but either way, um, that's a little bit unresolved, but also an interesting um, result that tells us more about mantle process. So really thinking about this all together and wrapping it up, um, what we're finding is that Ocean island basalts are tapping mantle source regions that are heterogeneous in radiogenic isotope space and trace element space, but for the most part, they're not highly variable in the del in delta 11b or boron. And when they are, it is always to the light delta b direction. And what this suggests is that the mantle might is likely becoming boron depleted over time in that more is more boron is getting recycled and concentrated in the continental crust at arcs. We see that heavy boron in arcs, but that once the subducting, you know, the boron can't make it past the subduction factory gauntlet and slabs are introducing very boron into the deeper mantle. But I started saying, what's the concentration and distribution of volatile elements in the mantle? So 
um, briefly getting into it. Um, there's still a lot of work to be done here, but our goal is to start comparing the volatile elements that we measured in the NALT inclusions to the boron isotopes. Um, and some preliminary data here, just showing the maximum water measured in a melt inclusion relative to cerium. Um, we find that not only are these um, ocean islands with recycled end members, do they have light delta 11b, they also have really low maximum water or water over cerium ratios. This is again, really different from ARCs. So here's some of um, data that I collected previously but most arc magmas have elevated water cerium and those heavier delta 11 boron values. And so this suggests that just like boron, though that oceanic crust might also be depleted in water. So is the mantle becoming water depleted over time? Um, well, I think it's a little too early to test that from, or to say that from a single plot, uh, there's a lot of work that we need to consider thinking about the influence of both water and cerium, whether or not cerium is a good thing to ratio for these sorts of magmas in comparison to these, um, and whether or not melt occlusions really are preserving initial water contents. Uh, recent work has suggested that melt occlusions might lose water and CO2 after entrapment. So um, stay tuned for the future of that work. Um, but I also did want to mention that uh, most of the most of what I'm up to today is actually thinking about intermediate arc volcanoes. So a pretty big change for me, but um, most of the work, um, my students, I have two master's students at Western Washington University, and they are both um, working on this project at Augustine Volcano in Alaska, which is one of the most active volcanoes in the Aleutians. It last erupted in 2006. Um, and we're trying to understand what controlled eruption size and style. And that's because um, historically, Augustine has erupted six, seven times in the last 150 years, but that historic record is pretty small. Uh, most of the eruptions uh, have small volcanian explosions, but mostly form sort of these less explosive domes. But if you go back 400 years and 800 years, you find these much thicker and more explosive looking deposits. So my colleagues at AVO, my colleague at AVO, Matt Lowen, and my colleague at Colgate, Allison Colzar, and I um, are doing a petrologic study to better understand um, what controls the differences in these eruption styles. Um, however, I am still working on cinder cones. I'm also involved in a project with Megan Newcomb, who's at the University of Maryland, really trying to understand um, magma decompression and the controls of, of magma decompression during a single cinder cone eruption. I think if doing this at La Palma, now that we have video evidence is very exciting, um, but uh, for now, we're going to be working on cinder cone, which is in Lassen National Park. Some previous work that I've done with colleagues suggested that there's two pretty different phases of the eruption. Um, and so we want to explore what the differences in those two phases are and the role decompression rate plays on those er that eruption style. Okay, that ending was a really big segue, but um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, we typically like to have the first question be from students or postdocs. So any students have a question? Or any faculty? <laughs> Hi. Oh, wait, I think Janine ha might have a question. Yes, I do, I do have questions. Um, so can I go first? Yeah. You're a student, okay. so yes. Right. Uh, thank you. Um, so I um, was wondering, the since you see so little um, kind of recycling component in the ocean island basalts in the boron isotopes, um, and you kind of relate that back to all of the boron being um, not getting being able to get past the arc system. Since yeah. boron and is a water soluble element that likes to follow water around, does that does your study also have implications for say how much water is actually um, making it into the deep mantle versus being recycled back to the arc? Yeah, that's a good question. So in many ways, boron 
follows the fluids. It's definitely a fluid mobile element. That being said, there is very little understanding of what phase it, what high pressure phases boron might partition to. Like once you get to that chloride, well, I don't know, once you get to that like 100 to 150 kilometers, you have a lot of phase changes. And so we know that eventually hydrogen goes into that phase A, which is serpentine goes to phase A. We have no idea if boron goes to phase A. I think you can, I guess, make thermodynamic hypotheses of whether or not boron fits into the phase A structure. But um, my understanding is like no experimental work has been done and very little experimental work has been done understanding the behavior of boron. And so sure, it, like I think our data implies that well, especially in the past, um, uh, dehydration was very efficient, but whether or not boron is a perfect proxy for water is not fully certain because of, we don't know where it lives in mineral structures at that depth. But that's a really good question. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I have a follow-up to ask about that, if it's okay. Um, so that was a great talk, Christina. I'm so glad that we had a chance to get you to give a talk since you spent so much time in Rhode Island and we barely got to bring you to campus. Um, so I wanted to I wanted to ask whether or not you're able to make any kind of connections between the the work and the places and the sort of mantle end members that you've hmm. tried to look at and the ones that Jackie Dixon pulled out in that great 2002 nature paper where she talked basically about how, how efficiently slabs are dehydrated through subduction zones by looking at recycled um, signatures and mostly they were plume influenced mid-ocean ridge basalts. Yeah. And a lot of those samples just to stick in a plug for a repository came from the URI collection. Yeah. So can you, can you make any links or, I mean, I know you didn't have a lot of sample suites sort of in common with that study no. And, and actually Jackie has a bunch of, um, so her more recent paper that came out in the 2017 paper. Yeah. So she has a yeah. bunch of boron isotope data, but it's also, um, it's all glass data. So we had a conversation, follow-up conversation of like, how much can you trust this glass data? Um, I didn't really delve into it, but we even found that if you looked at a melt inclusion suite from the same glass or scoria sample, there was usually like a one or two per mil offset, um, suggesting that you should probably trust the melt inclusion data more. Um, we, so we have, so I studied in more detail the La Palma melt inclusions because we had a lot more data. And I think we did some really nice modeling there, mixing modeling, because there we know that based on both a combination of radiogenic isotopes and things like osmium isotopes. Previous work suggested that it really is an ocean, like an oceanic crust component in the mantle source. Um, where, so right now we, so we have this massive data set, and I'm working with Linda Kirstein, and we actually have halogen data, and we're trying to pull in both the halogen data and the boron data to see like at places where the mantle source is supposed to be um, like a sediment end member, is that lighter boron, like do we see more boron? But, but for the most part, it's weird that, you know, all of the end members that have a recycled component and it doesn't matter what that recycled component is, it's light boron and low boron concentrations. So it almost doesn't matter what it started as. So it's not, perhaps boron isn't as good at pulling apart sediment or, you know, delaminated lithosphere as trace element ratios might be. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess, I mean, it's, I, I'm, I'm interested in the idea though that you might be able to see boron following water cerium, right? Oh. Because you um, you showed nicely that like you know the OIBs that you're looking at have the same water cerium ratios as MORB and the same boron characteristics as MORB and but in fact it's interesting when you start looking closely at MORBs there are big variations oh. in the water cerium ratios of MORB 
maps. And especially, for example, if you go to the North Atlantic, there are very high water cerium ratios there. And I wonder um, mm. if boron might follow that. Oh, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know if I can comment on that exactly. Okay, so well, we I, can talk about it a little bit because again, we, we have samples of this stuff that, um, that might be very relevant. Yeah, we should definitely talk about it more um, for anything that has more variable water cerium. Um, but I, yeah, I have a sneaking, like water cerium might be more variable than boron, <laughs> right? I think that's what my answer might be. Um, and so maybe it's worth focusing more on the water cerium than it is on the boron. Mm -hmm. um, but trying to tease out that variability is something I want to do. But one of the hardest things right now is just because it's your max water cerium is that your primary water cerium. And that's what I'm struggling with most. And I think that's why, you know, I tried to, it's like, how, how's mimic mimic going and trying to correct for that hydrogen loss and saying, okay, I think this is real. Um, and I tried to do it for Hawaii, but Hawaii is like 30% post entrapment crystallization. So anyway. I, sorry, I got in really jargony right there. But yeah, we, I, I would love to have a follow-up conversation to talk in more detail about the data variability for sure. Hi, um, thank you for a very interesting talk. I want to hear your opinion on David Berkovici and Sean Corrado's transitions on water filter hypothesis. Mm in the sense that uh, what you see at the OIB might not reflect uh, the water uh, transportation into the deep mantle. Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm not, I don't think boron isotopes alone can address that. And one of the reasons is, well, do you see a plume as a thermal chemical anomaly where there is a package of material that is coming from the core mantle boundary all the way to the surface? Or is it simply a, a thermal anomaly where, whereby you know, you're melting different parts of the mantle, you know, or where are you melting the mantle? And so I think at La Reunion, some of our data suggests that a lot of the melting is there is a thermal anomaly and a lot of the material that's actually melting is the uppermost mantle. And so are we really sampling boron in the deep mantle or are we sampling boron in the uppermost mantle? And with boron alone, I don't know if I can answer the question of the filter um, where, you know, if you're thinking, oh, plumes like places where we know there are deep seated mantle plumes like Hawaii or Iceland or La Reunion, sure, maybe those are telling us about the deep mantle. So would that tell us, does the transitions, is the transition zone a filter? But I think because when we go to a place like that and our boron signal may or may not be diluted by the upper mantle, it suggests that, well, I, I don't know if our data can address that. Sorry, that was me sort of circling back in my head but did, did that address your question? Yeah, was, uh, at, at one point, you commented that uh, because uh, boron isotope is so uh, like or similar to MOG, and uh, your inference is that uh, the water is dehydrated at, yeah. uh, at the subduction zones. So there's very little water into the deep mantle. Yeah. So I was just wondering uh, if there is a water filter at the transition zone, as Kovici mm. uh, and the Corrado. Um, hypothesis uh, suggest, then the melting would occur uh, above the full mm. tent continuity and the melts generated over there tend to be dense and the state above 410. So the water is again a strip at that point, but you could have water coming down into the deep mantle. So th that's sort of, even though the end result is the same at, uh, at uh, a volcanic arc, uh, the process is different. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Yeah. So you could be forming that signature in that the transition zone, although based on 
the fractionation factor of boron at temperatures of the transition zone, you wouldn't actually expect fractionation. So I don't think that the light isotopic signature could be created during dehydration at the transition zone because of the behavior of, or at least the mass difference of 11 and 10 boron. Christina, do you know what the boron story is for the one transition zone diamond that gave us the hydroswadsleyite that's now been lost? Yes. There must have been a boron story with that diamond. Do you know? Yeah, so my understanding is that there are these blue diamonds from the transition zone that that have a lot of boron, um, but I'm pretty sure no one has measured the boron isotopes in them. And so that's just a hypothesis. And so those few studies, so actually my work is really at odds with some of those diamond studies and that there's like two diamonds that people are like, oh, these are blue and they have high boron. Therefore, there's a lot of boron in the transition zone. But I don't know, I guess it's, a, it's an argument of scale. Like is the entire transition zone filled with super or a ton of boron or is this a really weird one-off thing? I, I don't have the answer to that. But yeah, so there's like a, a handful of transition zone diamonds that are blue that people think they're enriched in boron. Sounds like you want to get hold of those blue diamonds. No, <laughs> <laughs> I do know Ivan Savov definitely wants to get a hold of the blue diamonds. <laughs> All right. But that's a, yeah, that's a really good question. And it's, I think in the outset of this project, we were more hopeful that we could say more specific things about different parts of the mantle. But of course, um, there's a lot of uncertainty down there. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you again for a great talk, Christina. It was great to have you here. Yeah, thanks, Isabel. It was really fun. Um, yeah, Katie and Janine, I don't know if, um, do you want me to send you an email and we can set up a meeting and chat about water cerium and more? <laughs> Yeah, we miss you. <laughs>